Coming up, I discover the U source. I play some games. I chat to Jeff. And end with a mysterious magazine. Let's get on then. If ever there was a piece of hardware with a story, this is it. In 1984, Curra, the company behind the famous microspeech unit, was working on a brand new add-on for the Spectrum. This device would provide an assembler, debugger and compiler all in the same unit. And this unit would be called the Curra U-Source. Later it was changed, mainly due to the cost of chip needed and the compiler was removed and in its place was an implementation of the fourth language. Adverts first appeared in October 1984, promising a radical new concept of add-on costing £44.50. In November 1984, the advert still claimed it would be available the following month. In December 1984, the same advert was published in Crash Magazine, still saying it would be available next month. Maybe a mistake by the magazines or PR departments, because Sinclair User had a different, less spectacular advert the same month with a name change switching from U-Source to Microsource. The advert saying available next month continued to be published in different magazines all the way to February 1985. Unbeknown to users, Carrar had been in financial difficulties since the back end of 1984 and had gone into liquidation. The adverts kept on going though. Luckily, DKtronics stepped in and bought Carrar along with all the rights in January 1985. Sadly, they decided not to move forward with the U-Source or Microsource and so the project was left to stagnate. A year later, a company negotiated the rights to produce and sell the unit from DKtronics, Quad House Computers. Later in 1987, a company called Simmons Electronics were offering the unit for tokens obtained from Popular Computing Weekly and were selling the unit for 1995. The USORS, or Microsource, is impossible to get hold of now because very few were actually sold. Luckily, technical genius Mark Smith, the man behind the ULA replacement, has taken up the challenge, and after a lot of digging around and contacting people, he managed to secure a set of original ROM chips, unused from the early Curra and DKtronics days. He then managed to get hold of an original interface, and so set about recreating this device. And here it is. A replicated board with original chips. The new Microsource. Like the original, it has no pass-through port, so it needs to be the last in the line if you need anything else connecting, such as a printer. Once plugged in, the unit is activated by a series of reserved words. So for example, to start the assembler, you enter let assemble equals one. However, it's not that simple. First, let's take a look at the assembler. This is a full Z80 assembler that supports macros, labels and conditions and lots of other technical things. Not that I know anything about that, of course. Adding lines of assembler is done via rem statements, which means they can be included in your own basic programs. It also means it can be cumbersome to use. Taking the example from the manual, this little bit of code will play a sound effect. And after a few seconds, you run the basic, which calls the assembler at line 10. The screen then shows that there are no errors, unless you're like me and added some extra spaces. The sound is then played using line 110. After a bit of tweaking to take out the extra spaces, we get a sound. Notice the use of labels. The label ZAP stores the starting address, for example, so we can just call the sound using randomized USR ZAP. The resulting Z80 output can be saved into memory or output to an open channel if you have Interface 1 attached. You can also save it to tape or microdrive. However, if you want to do that, you need to know the length and starting address. And here you can use an op code. So adding line 105, op32 and reassembling, this will give you the start address and length. You can now save the code to tape or microdrive or disk if it takes your fancy. Each rem line contains a line number, the rem statement, an exclamation mark that indicates that this is assembler, a label, an opcode and an operand. You can add comments to these using semicolons at the end. And also string multiple commands together in one line if you really want to, but as I've said before, it gets a bit messy. Variables can be shared across basic, assembler and forth. So if you're feeling adventurous, you can have all three languages working together in a single basic listing. The manual covers many, many more in-depth assembler details, including pseudo-ops and macros. 
Moving on to fourth then, and this is a sort of simplified version of the language. It uses the same method as assembler to insert lines of code into rem statements. Taking the example from the manual again, this is how it looks. A bit messy really. Instead of the exclamation mark to indicate assembler, you now use the hash sign. This example uses both basic and fourth in the same listing. I don't really understand fourth, and when you run it, it just prints a number on screen, and I have no idea if that's correct or not. Again, the manual goes into much deeper details about this. On to the debugger then. The debugger allows stepping through code, line by line, and viewing all the registers. You can send the results to a printer, although the magazine reviews had issues with certain printers. You can load some machine code, for example, and then step through it by entering let debug equal and the start address of the code. You'll then see a list of all the registers and details about the state of the Z80. Pressing S will step through to the next operation. Stepping through the code, you load it line by line. Pressing E will exchange register pairs. Pressing G will move through until it reaches a breakpoint, which hopefully you previously set. Otherwise, it will just keep on going. And again, there are many more things in the manual that cover all the options. For someone who is not familiar with assembler or fourth, this was a complex and often confusing thing. But I can see, for people who know their pops from their rets, this could have been useful back in the day, or even now. The unit itself seems very useful for programmers, whether fourth or assembler, but it did have some problems, and these were all in the original ROMs. It had some minor bugs, probably due to the long project plan and multiple companies taking over it. The printing is one such bug, along with a small problem with the fourth that moves away from the standard language definitions. Having tools on ROM is handy, no load times, which is good if things crash, and you can quickly get the debugger back and running and see what's going on. I do not profess to be an expert on assembler or fourth, so I can't comment on the complexities of this device, beyond what I've said here. But I can say, it's great that it's been saved and people will be able to try it out for themselves, if they so desired. So hats off to Mark for taking on this work and getting it done. Wheelie was released by Microsphere in 1983, and it's a totally original idea that quickly became a favourite of many players. Riding your turbocharged ZX Arky 500 motorbike, you see a sign for a road with no speed limits and decide to try it out. It turns out you've entered a strange world with giant hedgehogs, dangerous jumps and uh, double-decker buses. To escape, you have to find the ghost rider at the far right of the road, and then race him back to the entrance. This is a horizontal scrolling racing platform game, where you control the speed of your bike using left and right, and can select whether to take the upper or lower tracks using up and down. Some lead to dead ends, others take you to jumps, that you have to make sure you're at the right speed to be able to complete them and others take you in the paths of giant hedgehogs, at least on level 1. Oh, and you've also got to keep an eye on your fuel. If you run out, it's game over. And the faster you go, the more fuel you use. Luckily, there are plenty of gas tins around, ready to collect. This game has a unique look and sound, and I don't think there's anything like it on the spectrum. The green landscape scrolls smoothly, and you navigate around, trying to memorise the paths. However, they change each time you play it. Climbing the hill slows you down, and descending the hill speeds you up, so you constantly have to adjust your speed to make sure you're right for whatever's coming next. If you see ice, you have to take it slow. If you see tyres, you have to try and avoid doing wheelies. And if you see a lump in the road, you have to do a wheelie to get over it. A highlight for me when I first played this was jumping over buses and cars. And once you get to know the correct speed, it becomes quite easy. If 
you get to the end, the Ghost Rider awaits, and then the race is on. I've never managed to do this, so this is the RZX replay. He just rides straight through scenery, and doesn't bother taking any routes at all. So you have to decide which is the best route back. If you complete that, there are other levels as well, which I never knew about. There are different things to avoid, like kangaroos and killer bees, and mixtures of everything. A challenging game that's different to anything else, and definitely worth a play. This is Night Gunner, from Digital Integration, released in 1983. Now, Digital Integration are best known for their simulations like Fighter Pilot and Gunship, and although not a fan of these, I decided to try one of their earlier efforts. I expected a black background with some white or dark blue things to shoot, but I was very surprised. But first, the inlay, and uh, a code sheet. Yes, this game's got protection. Anyway, on to the game. The game claims to have 30 different missions, and it is, in fact, a 3D shooter, and one that very much reminds me of Zoom from Imagine Software, as we'll soon find out. There are different missions, and you work your way through them in order, and each mission has two parts, alternative plane shooting and ground-based attacks. Mission 1, and you just shoot everything. Planes swoop towards you, and you have to protect your own plane. Barrage balloons drift past, and larger bombers cross your path as well, and these can be shot for extra points. Moving the targets using your joystick or keys, you just blast away, keeping an eye on your ammunition. And also the timer at the bottom left. When this reaches zero, it's onto the second part of the mission. The graphics are quite nice for an early game, the 3D effect works well, and control and sound are good, and I enjoyed this little surprise. On to the second part, and here you have to bomb an enemy airfield. You line up your bombs as the planes pass randomly beneath you, and once your bombs are all used up, it's back to the plane shooting. Mission 2 is much the same, starting with more aggressive planes, and then moving to another airfield attack, and this time with missiles. Here though you can hit the ground if you fly too low, so you have to be careful. Mission 3. More planes followed by tank bombing, and so it goes on. Other missions include a mixture of planes and ground-based targets. Overall game that, as you can see, reminds me of Zoom. But a decent shooter nonetheless, especially for an early game, with lots of levels and a decent challenge. So, Paul, this was a Patreon request. Arcade conversions, the good, the bad, and the ugly. It was, and we have covered some of the games, or some arcade games in the past. So it'd be interesting to pick one for each category each. Let's do uh, let's do ugly first. Go on, then. What's your ugly? Uh, my game for being most ugly is P47 Thunderbolt Level 2. And it's a horizontal shoot-em-up game. And level two is bright red and black, and it hurts your eyes. It's terrible. You can't see what's going on, and it's just a mass of red, and it's awful to play because because of that. Oh, hold on. So it's like black features on a red, bright red background. Yes. Yes. Oh, that sounds horrible. And and, and it's got parallax scrolling to make it even worse. <laughs> that does sound pretty bad. I took a slightly different approach to Ugly. I chose Outrun. Oh, well, that's a surprise. Okay. The strange thing is, Outrun on the arcade, especially at the time, was a beautiful game, and the Spectrum mm. version just seemed to be so less beautiful that I'm calling it Ugly. And it had an atrocious frame rate. And oh, it was something like one frame a, one frame a second, though. Yeah. It? it was terrible. <laughs> really unresponsive controls. And it was multi-load. That's my Ugly. Might be controversial. You go first with Bad. 
okay, my bad is Dragon's Lair. Ah, yes. <laughs> and, and no, I'm, goes, not even, I'm not even going to argue against that one. <laughs> and this goes, this goes back to back in the day when I bought it, and I, I'd seen, obviously seen Dragon's Lair in the arcade. I was hoping that playing it on the Spectrum would help me get better on the arcade. Rushed home with it, loaded it up, and oh my god, was it bad. Well, the graphics weren't too bad, and I think that was the problem. They weren't obviously as good as the Laserdisc. They were never going to be. But Dirk looked a bit like Dirk from memory. Right. It just played so badly. It was really, really unresponsive. I mean, if you play Dragon Slayer, all the games are really short, little like mini game mm. things. But they were multi load. Yeah. Oh, really? I've not. I've not actually played it from a real cassette. So you you got the first uh, room, as it were. You pressed up and left, and then it had to load the second room. Is that yeah, like that. Oh, pretty much. Yeah. It was multi load. Ah, oh, ah, oh, and of course the rooms are randomised. <laughs> that makes it even worse. <laughs> yeah, that, that's my. Someone's gonna. Someone's in the comments gonna say, "No, you're completely wrong. Actually, it was like this." But I, that my memory is, it was multi load. The rooms were randomised, so it would say, "Go forward on the tape, go backwards on the tape, or something like that." When you got the wrong one. My bad game is going to be something that a lot of people will probably be shouting at their screen now, and it's one that I hate. It's Crazy Kong from SeaTech, the infamous early version of the arcade game where it was incompletable. The adverts all said three levels. It wasn't. There was only two. Even if you could get onto two, it had controls for moving left and moving right and jumping left and jumping right. And at the end of the day, I think it was compiled basic because key repeat kicked in after a while and it was just terrible. <laughs> key repeat kicked in after a while. Uh, everybody knows how bad it was. But your turn to go first then. What's your good? My good is a game that I really wanted when it came out. It was advertised. I'd played it in the arcades. My local computer shop didn't stock it. I had to go into a nearby city to get it. And when I got it, I thought it was absolutely fantastic. And that is Mooncrester. You know, I was thought you were going to say Phoenix because you always love Phoenix, but and they're, yeah. and they're similar-ish, I guess, vertical shooters. Yeah, I actually, I completely forgot about Phoenix. Can I swap? <laughs> <laughs> no, tell us about Mooncrester. Mooncrester is a good game. It's a good game. It's got most, most if not all of the features of the arcade. It's got the tunes. It's got the docking sequence. It's got all of the aliens. For me, it's easy to complete, which makes it even better. My good is a game that did make me better at the arcade. It's Bomb Jack. Oh, yes. I'd have, oh, I should have remembered you'd like that and picked that one. <laughs> yeah, I remember getting Bomb Jack. And I think I played it once in the arcade on holiday many, many years before. And I saw it and, start, and bought it and played it and absolutely adored it. It's such mm. a good game. It's a great game in the arcade as well. But I do remember playing it on the Spectrum and learning the sequence of all the um, lift bombs. So you collect all... If you can collect all the lift bombs on the screen, you get a 50,000, I think it is, point bonus. Mm. And playing it on the Spectrum made me learn the sequence of the bombs to collect to get the big bonus. And then when I went back to the arcade, I I knew they were the same, which was brilliant. (laughs) Oh, right. Well, that's interesting because a lot of Spectrum conversions, uh, the timing's off or the things are not in the right place or in the right order. Mm. Bomb Jack, I mean, it plays really well. It's, I think, of all the epic conversions, the Spectrum is considered the best, and it's a, it's an absolutely brilliant game. Well, there you go. That was the good, the bad, and the ugly. Do you think someone in the comments is going to say, why didn't, why do you say Commando for the best one? D- well, definitely, there, there were a lot of good arcade clones and Commando and Carry Goblin. Warriors. But we could only pick one each. And we, we couldn't pick, for the good anyway, we couldn't pick, pick modern ones. We wanted to stick to the originals. Otherwise, we'd have both have been picking Allens, wouldn't we? <laughs> we'd have both been picking Allens' work with um, Asteroids and Pac-Man. Pac-Man and Loon Rescue. Loon the Rescue, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, on that, we'll say, if we could have picked modern ones, Allens are clearly the best. ever there was a sport that only just beat watching paint dry as a hobby, it would be fishing. I have a sneaking suspicion men only do it to get out of the house. Because it's a lesser known and watched sport, the personalities linked to it would not sell a game. However, take a world-renowned footballer who just happens to like fishing and you may have something. And that something is Jack Charlton. Jack Charlton is an English footballer that was part of the World Cup winning squad in 1966. His playing career was impressive 
staying with Leeds United throughout and representing England 35 times. He went on to manage other clubs such as Middlesbrough and Newcastle United. He even had his own TV show, Go Fishing with Jack Charlton. What better way to celebrate his footballing greatness than to release a fishing game? In 1985, Alligator Software released Jack Charlton's Match Fishing. Before I played this, I didn't know how anyone could create a game about this sport, but we'll find out. It's a multiplayer simultaneous game for up to six players. Each player enters their name. They are then given a random pitch, or place to fish from, with a description, and based on that description, each player must then pick their tackle the type of rod, the line strength, the hook size, and of course bait. And then the match begins. You see a very nicely drawn picture of the location and each peg or pitch is shown. And then you wait. If any player has picked the right tackle for the area described previously, then they may get a bite. If this happens, the number will flash, which represents the number of the player. They then have to hit that number key as quickly as possible. If they do it in time, the view then changes, and here, a fish approaches the bait, and once it starts to eat it, you hit space to catch it. You're then told what you've caught, and how much it weighs, and then it's back to the rest of the match, until the time runs out. If nothing happens, you have the option to change your tackle at any point. If you had three or four friends who like fishing, I could probably see how this might be interesting. It does represent the sport though, a lot of sitting about, interrupted for very brief periods of time when something happens. This is Aliens Neo Plasma 2, released by Sync Lair in 2024. This game is available for the next and the normal spectrum, and in various languages. It's not free, so you do have to purchase it. This is the demo version. After a nice intro, you set off on your mission. The storytelling is done well, and is introduced as the game plays along, and the graphics as you can see are superb. Control can be redefined, and it works well. You start off working your way around the complex, and getting killed in many glorious different ways. You will learn eventually how to get past the different sections, jumping, crawling and running. And after playing the demo, if you want more, you can go ahead and get the full version. game all round, although I did find it a bit difficult later on. This is Embassy Assault, released by Sinclair Research in 1982. You're a top secret agent and have been given a task of gaining access to a foreign embassy, locating some top secret codes and getting out in the fastest time. The game has multiple difficulty levels and each will take a while to generate a random map. Once started you get a 3D view, drawn very slowly. 
A compass at the bottom of the screen shows which direction you're facing. You can move around and you may come across maps on the wall and you can view these if needed. Not a very top secret building is it if they've got maps everywhere. You will also find stairs leading up or down. Moving around on the easy level will get you to the secret code room quite quickly, clearly signed so that nobody knows where it is. Mm. Once in, you are shown in flashing letters that this is the code room. You don't have to do anything and nothing happens. You've completed half the game by this point. All you need to do now is turn around and get out again. And it's all done in glorious silence. This is just a 3D maze game, like so many others at the time. It has a nice story and the addition of stairs, which some comparable titles did not. I found it easier to set the emulator at twice the speed, and the game felt much better to play. On the easy level, I managed to get in, find the codes and get out again in 16 seconds. The challenge though lies with harder levels, where the code rooms aren't just five steps away, two floors up. A run-of-the-mill maze game then, and one you've probably played and discarded in favour of something more exciting. Sometimes when you flick through old magazines, something jumps out at you. And in this particular instance, I was reading Personal Computer News from January 1984 and saw this a full-page advert for a tape magazine that I'd never heard of before. I quickly did a search on the internet and found nothing. It seems to have been a good deal, a tape magazine every month for £6. Then something didn't feel right. Firstly, it was from Abu Dhabi. I didn't know Spectrums had reached that far in 1984. And also in the first issue, they were giving away some quite good games. Jetpack, Transam, Arcadia, Astro Blaster, hmm, all original titles. I made a mental note to try and find out more in the future, but I didn't have to wait long. In the next issue of the magazine was a statement. Offshore pirate in Gulf Haven. Imagine Software, some of whom's games were advertised, were not happy, as you can imagine. Uh, sorry about the pun. Despite having legal action against similar things in Belgium and Spain, Imagine say they would not be taking action about this. They would just try and stop the tapes arriving in the UK. Apparently, the advert was also published in Computer Answers and Personal Computer World, and have now been banned in those magazines. Having contacted Kodan, they say that they would not be placing the advert again, and when asked about pirate games, they said, and I quote, I can't talk now, I don't have time, I have many work. It would be interesting if anyone actually got any of these magazines, or in fact if they ever existed in the first place. Was it just one big scam? This is why I love old magazines.